Hello and welcome back to National Ag Day live from Martin Place in Sydney. We're about to commence our last live cross to um, our last host farmer. But before we do, just a quick reminder that uh, if you want to participate in the photo competition that's running today as part of Ag Day, you can take a photo that captures ag innovation and upload it to agday.org.au or you can also upload some fantastic photos to um, AgDayAU is the hashtag. Participate in all the love sharing for our great, fantastic Australian farmers. We are nearing the end of the day, but I wanted a chance to quickly talk about some of the work that I do at the National Farmers Federation. Uh, so I actually am in the fortunate position to run a gap year program at NFF. And uh, our gap year program allows young Australians between 17 and 25 to get a year's paid work experience on host farms around the country. And that's in all agricultural and food production industries such as horticulture, viticulture, aquaculture. Uh, we've got placements in beef, cattle, in the grain industry, in the cotton industry, all over the country. So if you've got anyone young in your life who is maybe keen to explore agriculture but hasn't quite had a chance, doesn't have experience, then that's where this program really comes into its own. And I'm excited to um, share that with you because the host, the farmer we're about to talk to now is actually hosting one of our Ag Career Start participants. So if you've got someone interested in maybe doing gap year in agriculture, check out agcareerstart.com.au. But I believe Debbie is on the line with us now. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Kayla. Hi, it's good to see you again. Hi, Kayla. Hi, it's good to see you again. <laughs> it's so lovely to see you too. Um, Debbie, I, I think I want to cast a bit of a, uh, an illustration here of just uh, your geographic location because you're quite remote. We are. We are uh, 600 kilometres north northeast of Perth, and if you can imagine the um, the desert, we're on the edge of the desert, really. Pretty remote area and um, pretty isolated, but a beautiful place in the, in the world to be living. Absolutely. And so you're in the southern rangelands area of Western Australia. It's quite a unique part of the world. Do you want to talk to us about what characterises the southern rangelands? The southern rangelands is 53 million hectares and it comprises of all of the pastoral country south of the Pilbara. And it, it really gets into the really hard doing sort of semi-arid blocks, which have traditionally been run by families and families in the Southern Rangelands can make a modest income on a property here. The average size of the property is about quarter of a million acres. And um, it's, it's never been a, a really um, attractive place for a lot of people to live, but but when you do live here, you develop a strong connection with the country because it's so unique and it's so special. And for us, it's the best place in the world to be. Absolutely. I have spent some time there myself and I have to say um, it's unlike anything else I've ever seen. Debbie, talk to us about the farm for anyone who might not have heard your earlier interview. Sure, we have about 200,000 hectares, so about half a million acres, and we run just a thousand breeding cows on that. <laughs> the wonders of uh, regional Couple connectivity. Of hours. Couple of hours. Oh, I think we got you back, Debbie. I think. I think. <laughs> Are we coming through okay, Debbie? Yep. Um, so our properties, um, so our we've only got a thousand cattle on our property and it's half a million acres. So they're really, really scattered around, around the countryside. countryside. Mm. Debbie, for people, I mean, half a uh, sorry, quarter million acres sounds like a lot, but I think it's hard to conceptualise. We're talking about uh, maybe time to cross the property. Just how long would it take you to drive from one place to another? Do you know, if we had really good, perfect roads, it would probably be an hour north to south. But because our roads are just tracks and, the, you know, you've got to travel sort of fairly steadily on tracks. Really, if I was to drive north to south as a station, I'd give myself two hours. I'd give myself two hours. Mm. Wow. Um, Debbie, you know, living in such an arid environment, it's really challenging. Do you want to talk about just how you're utilising technology to overcome, you know, the significant challenges of trying to produce beef in that area. It 
Yes, look, it can be really challenging. And one of the things is that you can't just walk out of the door and see all of the cows in the paddock and what they're eating. So we've um, installed about 100 Ceres tags. So they're satellite tracking ear tags. And so they're on our cattle and our cattle go out and every six hours we get a location of where they are. So we can actually track where they're going and what they're doing and learn their habits and um, the, the satellite tracking technology is just giving us an unprecedented insight into the movement and behaviour of our animals because in the past we've only ever seen them if we've driven past them at, at water holes or windmills and now we can actually see where they are even if they're out the back of beyond and they've found a nice little pool that they can have a drink at after some rain, we still know where they are. And we can overlay that with satellite imagery from um, SIBO Labs. So SIBO Labs technology gives us an, an idea of how much food's on offer, how quickly the food's growing, and where the best feed is for the cattle. So when you combine both of those bits of technology together, you get an incredibly good insight into what's happening out on the huge property in the rangelands. Yeah. And Debbie, I, I think something that people might not have a good um, idea about is just um, how tough the management of water is in the southern rangelands. You know, there's not a lot of it. And on, a, on country as sparse as yours and as spread out, you really have to keep an eye on all the water available to your stock. Oh, absolutely. The, the water is the one crucial thing that we cannot ever let go. We cannot forget about it. And in the past, we used to do mill runs every four days. And our mill runs, it takes about a, a day to do a mill run and we've got four separate mill runs. So you're almost constantly driving around the windmills. The theory being that if you drive away and something goes wrong in that tank, there'll be about four days water for the animals. But these days with the assistance of technology, we're able to log on to our computer and check all of those windmills every day. And we can instantly see if there's a problem somewhere out on the in the remote part of the station and then respond very quickly to that problem. And it means that we still have to go around and clean our troughs and check things, but we can do that once a fortnight now instead of every four days. It's an incredibly useful advance in technology and something that has saved us a lot of time and a lot of diesel as well. So it's fantastic to be able to tap into that sort of thing when you've got such a huge property. Mm. And like Debbie, you just said, you know, I mean, there's obvious cost savings there in, in um, wear and tear on your vehicles, but also wear and tear on your people and the use of human resources. But it's also an animal welfare issue too. Oh, absolutely it is. And we we would just be horrified if we had water problems that we didn't know about and some of our animals suffered because of that. And um, that's why we prioritise water so strongly, particularly coming into the summer months. It's so hot here and it's so dry that we just can't for a minute forget about water for our animals. And while we're talking about water and the environment, do you want to talk, us, talk to us about some of the incredible projects you've got going on on, on your station to uh, sequester carbon? We've got a human-induced regeneration project here, and that means that we need to manage our cattle so that they don't impact the regrowing native forests. And in the past, the previous owners of part of our station were around the country pretty hard and you can see where the cattle really started to eat the trees because there was no grasses left and no bushes. But we manage our country really carefully and really conservatively. So now when there's, um, when there's feed for the cows, they're wandering around eating all the grass, but we've got so few cows here that if there's not much feed, they can still, if there hasn't been much rain, they can still find feed on the ground and we stop them from going into the, regenerating mulga forests and by that we uh, by doing that by controlling where our cattle are grazing we can um, sequester a lot more carbon in those regenerated native forests and we can actually derive an income from that which allows us then of course to spend more money on doing what we really love doing and that's looking after the station and looking after the cattle. Mm. Um, I think 
people talk about innovation and often um, associate that with technology, but I think particularly in the southern rangelands, innovation is much more about problem solving and use the tool, using the tools that are available to you. It, it certainly is. And um, we're, we're constantly looking at ways to do things more efficiently using innovation because labor is so expensive and it has in the past been very difficult to find good people to work on the property. And, um, and there's, there's, there's just the two of us running the station most of the time. So my husband and I have been running it for the last 20 years together. And um, it's such a lot of work. And the margins are so thin here. It's not like we're really rich, prosperous cattle farmers. It, we've got to be very careful and very conservative about our spending to break even. So innovation and technology is something that we really need to tap into in order to be sustainable as a business. Mm. Um, Debbie, you touched on workforce, so I think it's a good segue. I want to ask you about Ag Career Start. You're a host farmer on the program. You've got Bradley out there this year. Do you want to talk to us about why you signed up to be a host farmer for a gap year program? We, we needed to find somebody good who would be interested in staying on our station for the long term. Because my husband and I are, you know, we're advancing in years, we're looking at retirement in the next um, 10 years or so, perhaps, we, um, we wanted to have somebody that we could potentially train as a long term person on our property, and maybe even um, to take over from us as a manager later on. And we stumbled across the Ag Career Start website. And um, it seemed like such a good idea to be able to get somebody with a real enthusiasm and passion for agriculture, but with no connections to agriculture, to, to um, invite them to our property as an employee and to work with them for a long term instead of just a short term where we sometimes have had backpackers for three months and then they move on. We wanted that long term relationship from somebody who was really keen to be involved in agriculture. And of course, Chalice Station Ag Career Start put us together and it has been an absolutely amazing success. <laughs> I have to agree. Um, certainly Bradley has come a long way because he really didn't have much experience in agriculture before he went out there, did he? His uncle had a farm and he sometimes visited his uncle's farm, but no, he really didn't. And that's really worked to our favour as well because we can train him in our ways so nice and fresh. So we're not having to undo habits that he might have picked up on a different property. We've got our own very um, unique way of handling our animals with low stress stockmanship and being really gentle and careful with them. And we wanted to pass that on to somebody and, and really to have a clean slate to work with is brilliant. So, that's so good to hear. Um, Debbie, do you want to talk to us about, um, just sort of, uh, for me, it's been a bit of a success story. You're, um, you're having Bradley come out there to Chalice Station. Do you want to talk about what you see him doing and the involvement you see him having in, in the station long term? Um, it really, the way Bradley's coming along and learning and um, understanding how we run our property, it, if he wanted to, he could stay on for, for the very long term. And um, because he's, he knows that everything here has to be done perfectly. Uh, every bit of work we do has to be done properly. And he's really keen to tap into that way of working. And yeah, really, if he wanted to stay around, we'd be happy to have him on uh, when, we, when we start thinking about retirement. Absolutely. He's a great asset to our business and, and a really nice young man to have around too. And uh, we're dubbing him in because he's actually in Roma right now at the Young Beef Producers Forum, which he's getting to do all paid for by uh, the Ag Career Start program, which is pretty cool. Um, but I guess I, I want to ask you more broadly, Debbie, when you look at agriculture and you've got children, you know, what do you think about the future of ag and what it has to offer young people? Uh, you know, sometimes young people think that agriculture is a bit of a boring, labour intensive industry. But it's not. We are on the cutting edge of incredible innovation and exciting technology. And it's a really, um, it's a very rewarding industry to be involved in, in the fact that you're growing something that's going to help to feed other people. And we know that there's 
a lot of people across Australia who really couldn't grow their own food and certainly couldn't have a cow in the backyard. And to be able to contribute to the overall Australian economy and do it in a sustainable and ethical manner, it's um, and it's a it's a brilliant business to be involved in. And now that um, young people are starting to focus a little bit more on agriculture, I think that there's more pathways for them to get into agriculture. And I really hope that if anybody's out there watching who's sort of considering a career in ag, to to um, have a bit of a look and see what you can tap into because there's some really incredibly good, exciting businesses out there. Well said, Debbie. How are you celebrating Ag Day today? Well, we have bought some new little bulls and we're going to be going down to the cattle yards shortly and working with those bulls and taking some DNA samples for them so that we can have that on record and to just um, get them ready to be put out with their beautiful new cow friends shortly. Wonderful. Well, we'll let you go do that, Debbie. Thank you so much for joining us today all the way from Chalice Station in regional Western Australia. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Kayla, and enjoy the rest of Thanks, your National Kayla, Ag Day. Enjoy the rest of your National Ag Day. Beauty. Well, that is the last live cross that we have got for National Ag Day 2022. But the festivities, let them not be over. Um, continue to share the love on social media. I do want to quickly acknowledge again our partners uh, for National Ag Day, Nutrient Ag Solutions, Syngenta, Australian Made, NBN Co. And um, I'm forgetting one, excuse me. Um, <laughs> But we have had a fantastic day here down at Martin Place and in Melbourne at South Bank. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to experience some of the VR. We have had some produce, which is absolutely all gone now. Um, one final reminder to participate in that photo competition um, and whether you've celebrated Ag Day in person, online, or at one of the many events we've got going on around the country. I believe there's about 150 events, Ag Day events going on around the country. Um, thank you for participating. Thank you for sharing the love. It's been a pleasure to be a moderator here today. And thank you also to my co-moderator in Melbourne, Rachel. Thanks so much, everybody.